let's prove that if f is a continuous and injective function on an interval i, then f is either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. And I'm going to try to do this like we did in class with a parametrization and uh, so that we can do it directly. So let's give this a shot. Okay, uh, let's let a, b, be some interval inside of i. So I can specify the endpoints. So uh, since a, b is an arbitrary interval in set inside of uh, the interval i, that means that we're going to, the proof that we do will be sufficiently general enough that it'll be true for the entire interval i. But I just needed some way to specify the endpoints. Or some endpoints, I guess I should say. <laughs> okay, since f is 1 to 1, what does this tell us? This tells us that we know that f of a is not equal to f of b. All right, we don't know which one's larger. Either f of a is larger than f of b, or f of b is larger than f of a, but we're going to separate this into two cases. So I'll do case one, and then case two you can try to do on your own. Case one would be, let's say that f of a is actually less than f of b. All right. So i.e., in other words, f of b minus f of a is definitely positive. So we're saying that the right endpoint is larger than the left endpoint. And what I'm going to try to show is I'm going to try to show that this function is therefore going to be increasing on the entire interval. So to that end, let's let x1 and x2 be in the interval i with a less than x1 less than x2 less than b. So in other words, I'm just taking two points out of the interval and uh, making sure that they're between a and b, and then just saying that x1 is less than x2. So what do I want to show? I want to show, since I have this now x1, which is less than x2, what I want to show is that f of x1 is going to be less than f of x2. And then this would give me the strict increase, the strict monotone increase that I was wishing for. OK, so let's draw a little sketch so we can kind of see what's going on here. So that we have an A, and we have a B inside of this general interval that could be around here and here. That's I. I'm saying that F of A is something. F of B is something. And I'm saying that F of B is bigger than f of a. So the function's doing something in here. It's 1 to 1, so it's going to have to go up to there. And my x1 and x2 are taken so that x1 and x2 are in here somewhere. Okay, so I'll go up. There's the f of x1. And then go up. And this is an f of x2. Okay, you might wish to pause and redraw this picture on your own, and uh, so you have it for reference. I'll probably have to refer back to it, so that way you can see what I'm aiming for with my direct proof. So what we're going to do now is we're going to define g of t to be equal to t times f of x2 plus 1 minus t times f of b. And we're going to define h of t to be equal to t f of x1 plus 1 minus t times f of a. OK, now these two functions are linear in terms of t, right? Because f of x1, f of x2, f of b, and f of a are just constants. So t is the only variable in the function. And it's a linear function in t because the power of t is only 1. So what is this thing effectively doing? Well, if t equals 0, then this is going to be f of b. And if t equals 1, then this function is going to come out to be f of x2. So back to our picture, what g does is g slowly moves from f of b to f of x2. And what h does is, well, if h of 0 is going to be f of a, and h of 0 is going to be f of x1, then it's going to be going from f of a to f of x1. So that's kind of what those defined g and h's are doing, is that they're coming in from the top and they're coming down from the bottom. 
and we're going to use that in order to show that f of x2 is definitely going to be larger than f of x1. Okay, so since these are continuous, since g and h are continuous, so is g minus h, right? Because the difference of two continuous functions is continuous. And notice what is g minus h evaluated at 0. Well, g minus h at 0 is equal to g of 0, which would be f of b, minus h of 0. And h of 0 would be f of a. So it's f of b minus f of a. Notice that f of b minus f of a is bigger than 0. So this right here is larger than 0. Okay. Furthermore, what else do we know? Well, also, in addition to g minus h of 0 being positive, being bigger than 0, we also know that g minus h, the function, never equals 0. It would never be equal to 0, because remember what this is doing. The g is moving along this line from f of b to f of x2 and the h is moving along f of from f of a to f of x1 along the y-axis. So since the function's injective, these two things will never cross each other. There's no place where they will hit each other and therefore g minus h of x just simply can never be zero. There's no way that it would ever be equal to zero. Since our original function f is one to one. Right? So it's continuous, it's bigger than zero, and it never actually reaches zero. So what do we get to conclude from there? Therefore, f of x2, or let's evaluate this at zero, sorry. <laughs> Got a little bit of ahead of myself there. What is g minus h of 1? Well, g minus h of 1 would be equal to g evaluated at 1, which is f of x2, minus h evaluated at 1, which is f of x1. We said that the function was positive at 0, and then it never actually reaches 0. So that means that this right here must be also greater than 0. It's still going to be positive. And so, and so, that means that f of x2 is larger than f of x1. So we suppose that x1 is less than x2, and we show f of x2 is larger than f of x1. I have this in reversed order here, but f of x2 is larger than f of x1. And so therefore, we have completed the proof of case 1 case 1 where f of a is less than f of b. So on your own pause the video and try on your own to try to do case 2. Case 2 would be where you assume that f of a is actually in reality bigger than f of b but your proof should be very very similar to what we just did in this one.